Welcome to For the Church, a podcast for the flock of Zion Presbyterian Church in Columbia, Tennessee. We want to help you think biblically about everyday matters. Zion Church exists to join Jesus and his mission to reach people with the gospel and then to equip his people to worship and serve. I'm your host, Keaton Paul, and joining me is my conversation partner and co-host, Seth Scruggs. Few things are more important to the Christian life than worship. In fact, worship in some capacity is why we get out of bed in the morning. Yet we see that the Bible takes worship incredibly seriously. How we relate to God is vital for us to think through and apply to our lives. But if you were to ask Christians how they related to God, we'd probably give vague answers about feelings and routines. Yet we all long to know God and be known by God. In this season, we want to explore Christian worship. Why do we worship? How do we worship? What are the means that God has given us to worship Him? What are the ways that Christians have worshipped throughout the ages? We're asking these sorts of questions and uh, somewhat applying them to why we do what we do. But before we jump into today, hey Seth, how are you? I'm good. I'm way better than I was last week. Yeah. Um, at, we're recording this on Thursday, and last night Logan Peck came up and he's like, "You were sick, man." Like, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I know. I'm doing a lot better. That's got always some, that's great. Got some coffee. Um, yeah, fired up. There's this this weird virus v- bug thing going around that like wipes people out for yep. 24 hours and maybe terrible. longer. Terrible. Yeah, that sounds. That sounds awful. I'm trying to, I'm trying to steer clear of it. <laughs> Good luck. I, yeah, I know. I, oh, <laughs> just a bunch of germs, just germs personified. Ger- germs personified. <laughs> I know. You know, it's. I've taught for long enough now to where I feel like I've I've caught just about every sort of bacteria and virus that there is to catch at this point. So I'm hoping at this. At this juncture of life, I've got a pretty decent immunity because, you know, I just spent the past six years every day surrounded by high schoolers who, like, they, they touch everything. I don't understand, like, the weird <laughs> tactile sensation type thing that they just have to have where they're just, like, touching everything. And it's like, that. stop touching my laptop. And that's my coffee mug. Like, why is your hand in my coffee mug? There's coffee in there. One, two. It's my my mug, and I I don't know. And you think you know they're like, you're 18. You're allowed to vote. Like what? it's it's pretty depressing. It, yeah, it can be a little. Oh, okay. Well, anyway, what are we talking about today? So, so, let's, yeah. let's just jump into that. <laughs> Um, <laughs> yeah, I don't know how to segue out of out of that talking about teenagers putting things in their mouths to <laughs> to this, but um, let's yeah. let, we can try. Uh, school <laughs> at school, you learn to read, and today we're talking about the reading of scripture in good. worship. That was good. I slept really good last night, so I feel <laughs> like I'm I'm firing on as many cylinders as I have, which is not very many, but. <laughs> Um, so, so yeah, today, you know, we, we're going through, we're looking at the, you know, some of the various elements, um, and components of, of worship. And one thing that, you know, I, I think it is, is unique to Zion's worship in contrast to many different branches within kind of, you know, broadly speaking, Bible believing Christianity, um, is this component uh, of reading scripture, um, in our, in the, we're talking now, you know, we, we've kind of contrasted by this point, um, the kind of different categories of worship, of, of worshiping broadly, uh, you know, kind of in everyday matters, Paul and Romans 12, uh, picking this up. And, but what we're really honing in now is what's going on on Sunday worship in a narrow facet. And so, you know, one of the questions that, that may seem, uh, at least to some people, a little bit redundant or obvious or, or something like that it is reading the Bible during worship. And I think most people would just assume, I would hope, that Christians on their Lord's Day gathering in some capacity are going are going to read the Bible. But you would be shocked, I think, um, that they're like at just how little in in certain places, not 
all, but in certain places within Bible-believing churches. You know, we have a high view of Scripture, um, and that's in, in our you know confession of faith of of some sort, whatever kind of whatever that may look like, whether it's twelve points on a you know website or something as robust as the Westminster Standards. Um, you know, believe in the inerrancy and infallibility that this is the Word of God. How little oftentimes people read the Bible in the context of of worship. And so, one thing we wanted to point out and and say that um, that maybe is is painfully obvious, but I think we maybe we take it for granted too, is that reading Scripture, reading the Word of God during your Lord's Day worship is a non-negotiable. <laughs> you, you, when, when the body of Christ gathers together to worship the risen Lord, one thing that you should do um, that I think we could we could give a biblical precedent for and say not only is there a biblical precedent for, not only is it largely commanded in Scripture, but it's prudent and something that we we should rejoice over is that we're going to read God's Word. Um, and so, you know, just thinking through, um, you know, biblical, biblically, theologically uh, in mind, this has been a precedent from the very beginning of the gathering of the church. Um, you know, going back to to Moses and Sinai. Uh, interestingly enough, the end of the book of Deuteronomy, um, Deuteronomy thirty one nine through twelve says this: When Moses wrote this law and gave it to the priests, the sons of Levi, who carried the ark of the covenant of the Lord, and all the elders of Israel, and Moses commanded them at the end of every seven years. At the set time in the year of release, at the Feast of Booths, when all Israel comes to appear before the Lord our God, at the place uh, that he will choose, you shall read this law before all of Israel in their hearing. Assemble the people, men, women, little ones, and the sojourner within your towns, that they may hear and learn to fear the Lord your God, and be careful to do all the words of this law. Brian Chappell, in his in his tremendous work on worship, Christ-centered worship, uh, says this in regards to these very verses. He says, These verses formally introduce the institution of Scripture reading in the history of Christian worship. And so, like, just right there, boom. Like, yes, this is, you know, there is a redemptive historical sort of precedent at this point, what's been written, it's, you know, the, the Torah is being written, but, you know, it's the book of Deuteronomy. So it's, it's being written and is written, you know, before their very sight. And then it's commanded, read this. And the kings are commanded to read the law and have their own copy going forward whenever the monarchy starts. Um, and so there, there is this institution, this precedent, this command, you, you as the gathered assembled group, kahal in the Hebrew, which is where, you know, you can translate that church or assembly. You know, in the New Testament, we have the Greek word ekklesia, um, which we translate church. And so there's almost this, like, weird dichotomy that people make with the assembly in the Old Testament and the church in the New, but both refer to church and assembly together. Um, you know, one's just a, a Hebrew word, and the other's a Greek word. But the the emphasis is the same that there's this gathering of of the people of God the covenant community to to sit under the means that the Lord has given them to to fellowship and commune with him and so here it starts at the very beginning um with this with this pronouncement but moving forward you know just thinking through this the monarchs happen um you know things go awry they don't practice this they don't keep the law the whole prophets are are really covenant lawyers who are saying you didn't keep the word of god um you you as the leaders did not keep it before the side of the people you did not read it in their hearing um and so they're exiled uh and then even after the exile book of nehemiah chapter 8 there's this there's this famous setting where ezra the scribe uh assembles the people gathers the people together, a, a large wooden podium is built, and he, along with his assistants and the leaders, the elders of uh, the covenant community, walk there. They open the scroll before the people, and all the people stand up, and the text says that they read from the law 
uh, basically all day. But verse 8 in particular, they read from the book, from the law of God, clearly, um, and they gave the sense so that the people understood the reading. So, um, you know, this the common practice, they're reading in Hebrew. Many people take it to be that they read it in Hebrew and then they gave some sort of Aramaic, the lingua franca of the time, an Aramaic paraphrase and explained kind of as they went so the people could understand what was going on. But the whole point was to, to read the book of the law slowly and clearly so that you could say, thus saith the Lord. You have heard today with your very ears the word of God. Um, therefore, <laughs> choose this day life, to, to quote uh, Moses back in the book of Deuteronomy. So, so, so even so think, there. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I want to stop you there because I've got two questions. Yeah, go here. for it. The first is in the outline here that, that mm-hmm. I have in front of me. You have a Hebrew word written. Yeah. Why? What is that Hebrew word? What is, what is, um, is the implication Mishpashar. of that? Um, so in the... Moving forward, kind of fr- from there, there's um, there's a tradition in kind of uh, Jewish culture um, called the pesherim or the the pesher. To to give the pesher is to is to make clear or to give some sort of paraphrasing to um, to the people as they're they reading. So it sets this precedent really to say you have somebody who is skilled with the text of scripture and their job and their task and their duty is not simply um, as a scribe who copies word for word and just reads it per se, but reads it and says, okay, now then that, you know, now then that we're here, this is a, there's a forwardness to the document, even here in Nehemiah, it's written in Hebrew. Most of the people are speaking Aramaic at this point. You, you, we want to make abundantly clear that you understand this. And because of the foreignness between this Hebrew or, you know, uh, cultural uh, separation between the two, written, you know, millennia before. Um, we need, now that we have people who are skilled in this text, who are well-versed, um, their task is to make clear what this means. Yeah. Okay, so that's kind of what I thought yeah. where that was going to go. Not that I can read Hebrew, which well, I could, but... That's kind of where I thought that was going. And so I just wanted to bring that out because historically, and I think we're going to talk about this in a minute, historically in the church, I think something we can take for granted now is that like I can pull up the Bible on my phone. Right. But historically, that has not always been the case. Not the case at all. Um, And so, but there is very, very clearly a biblical precedent, Mm -hmm. not necessarily for everyone being able to read it, because obviously maybe not everyone could read at this point or something like that, Mm -hmm. but there is a precedent for the people, meaning like the everyday, what we would call like lay people now, being able to understand Mm -hmm. the text, that they are not just passively part of some sort of ceremony that they're observing. Yes. But rather they're hearing the law. Mm -hmm. They are being they they're being they're being read the law in a way that they can understand. Yeah. Which then I think implicitly carries this responsibility of being able to then follow and carry out the law. Yeah, for sure. So so I just wanted to bring that out because I think it's something we take for granted that every Sunday yeah we even even if maybe you're a child who can't read. Right. You're being read scripture in a way that is um, understandable. Mm-hmm. And even in the cases, not necessarily in a sermon, but in, you know, our Old Testament scripture reading, if we're yeah. in a New Testament passage, right. there's always a little bit of like, okay, here's some context and here's, yeah. here's where we are and here's what's going on so that we understand what's happening. Yeah, and, for sure. And it, so it isn't even necessarily like, let's exposit the scriptures as good as that can be. Mm-hmm. Even just a little bit of like, here's our footing, here's where we are. Yeah. Moving, you know, let's read the scripture. Right. I, I think we can really take that for granted. We do. I think we we take it massively for granted. Um, and we'll get to this in a little bit to kind of the the historical development right. here is is huge. So I don't want to jump too far ahead. Yeah. But yeah, absolutely. I just wanted to point out there is there is a huge like this biblical precedent yeah. of the people are accessing the meaning of scripture right. 
as a biblical precedent is incredibly right. important. Yeah, massively, massively important. So, um, so that's that's happening. That's a huge part of their worship, um, and, and a, what it a huge part of what it means to be a part of this covenant community is to sit under. Um, in a like in this in Nehemiah eight, it's it's not only sitting under metaphorically, but it, there is a physicalness to it too. Of, of he, they're on this podium, um, seeing the the scroll open before them, and there's this beautiful representation of of you know we are not a law unto ourselves, um, but we sit under this this covenantal this good covenantal law. Um, that the, the Lord is, has been gracious to give us. And so some people, you know, would take that. You have, here we are, you have a passage commanding it in Deuteronomy 31. You have it, which is, you know, towards the beginning of, of the Old Testament. Here in Nehemiah 8, it's at, chronologically, the very, very end of the Old Testament. And so a lot of people would say, well, you know, that's kind of a, it's kind of an Old Testament thing. It's for a primitive, illiterate community and people. Um, which, you know, yeah, the percentage of, of literacy, uh, in ancient Israel or even first century Israel, uh, is lower than probably America today, but probably the worldwide literacy rate, the, the Jewish community and the covenant community, because we are a people of the book, um, the literacy rate amongst the Judeo Christian tradition and community is actually massively higher than um, than most communities uh, throughout history. So that's you know that's one thing. Yeah, they're uh, primitive in that they came before, but they're not massively illiterate. Um, and there's been a lot of recent studies to to really kind of demonstrate this that even in the early church, um, you know, again the number of liter- the literacy rate was was smaller than maybe in America today. But in the grand scheme of the ancient world, it was very high. Um, so you had people who, who were well aware of, of the written text, but nonetheless, um, we, some people can look at it and say, that's Old Testament, New Testament, we have, you know, various modes or different things. And so that's a boring, outdated mode and, you know, (laughs) intellectually condescending to have somebody read to me. That's ridiculous. I don't, I can read. I don't need somebody to read to me, which, you know, I think you overestimate yourself if uh, you've never been read to and haven't gotten something that you wouldn't read. But but when we come to the New Testament itself, there's a command again. Paul, um, writing to his his young mentee Timothy in 1 Timothy 4, 13, he says this, Until I come, devote yourself to the public reading of Scripture, to exhortation, to teaching. So, so what's, you know, here's Timothy is, he's this young pastor being mentored by Paul, overseeing this church. Um, you know, there's obviously some tension there, some things going on. Uh, Paul is mentoring him uh, at this point from afar, that's the letter writing. And what's the first thing, like this big exhortation, Timothy, here's like to be a good pastor. Here's what you need to do. You, you need to devote yourself to the public reading of Scripture. Um, it's a priority in the church and, uh, and in their gathered worship in particular. Uh, this public reading of Scripture is, is a vital aspect of, of pastoral ministry, and it's a vital aspect of how God feeds his people uh, here even in this New Testament context. Um, and interestingly, he separates the public reading of scripture mm-hmm. and exhortation and teaching. We're going to come to that. Yeah. Yeah. That, well, and I, I know you, you, there's an entire historical development, but yeah, I yeah, think yeah. me, a layperson, coming to that, it's like, oh, reading scripture mm-hmm. independently of teaching, mm-hmm. which obviously teaching is incredibly important mm-hmm. and you should be reading the Bible and teaching, mm-hmm. but just reading scripture mm-hmm. is valuable mm-hmm. in and of itself. Yeah. Um, and, I, and I think that that's what I get out of him kind of separating those things, yeah. right? Is like each of these things are independently valuable. Right. That it, obviously they go hand in hand mm-hmm. and should. Yeah. But there is something just valuable to the reading of scripture. And I'm probably going to step on 
what we're going to talk about later, but just like the idea yeah. that like in our worship services mm-hmm. at Zion, mm-hmm. we have teaching, mm-hmm. we have what I would call exhortation, yeah. you know, the, these assurance of pardons and yeah. all of those kinds of things. But then also we just have independent reading of scripture. Yep. Like we are just going to read a passage together as a church. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, and so the, there is value in mm-hmm. just reading scripture. I think that's incredibly important to, Absolutely. to pull out there. Absolutely. Yeah. And I, you know, there's exegetical grounding for it, right? There's, there's, there's good textual, to use a different word, good textual reasons for using that. Um, and I, going with that, I think is, is a rich theological truth um, that we'll actually say for the end. So anyway, but, but kind of, so that's, you know, there in the early church, the writing of the New Testament, here Paul is saying, devote yourself to this public reading of Scripture. While this is going on, and even predating it to, to a degree, what you have is this development of synagogue worship, um, which, you know, in, <laughs> in very nerdy scholarly groups, there's like, a, I think, sometimes an overemphasis on um, synagogue worship as it pertains to Christian worship. Sure, it develops out of it. Yes, that makes sense. Some people just totally bug out about it, and it's you know they get crazy with it. But oftentimes we kind of miss the fact that um, early Christian worship was a natural, organic outflow of synagogue worship. Right when Jesus goes into uh, a synagogue and opens up the text of Scripture, which he does because he's a rabbi and reads from the scroll of Isaiah. He's partaking of synagogue worship. And, you know, there's value there. Well, here's an interesting fact. In synagogue worship, now, granted, the synagogue had to be something developed because of exile, what's known as the Jewish diaspora, and, um, you know, the temple is torn down, and, you know, Ezra and Nehemiah, they come back, they rebuild the temple. There's all kinds of stuff in this 400 years of silence between the Old Testament and New Testament, and a lot of Jews don't come back to uh, Jerusalem in particular, so they develop this kind of synagogue uh, structure. They're not offering up sacrifices uh, in the synagogue. You can only do that at the temple. But how do we how do we keep our Jewishness? Well, the center of synagogue worship, what it means to be a part of this covenant community um, in that part of redemptive history before Christ. Um, since we can't go to the temple regularly, uh, you know, there's still a command to, for them to go and offer up sacrifices annually. But um, what do we do in the meantime? Well, the primary thing is gathering together to hear the Bible read. And the rabbi would get up, scribe, open up the text, and would read. And sometimes maybe make a comment or two for clarity, the pesher. Um, But that aspect, which we could call preaching, and um, there's good linguistic reasons why, um, you know, in the early first century BC and AD, um, you know, the, the term that we use for preaching coming from the Greek, um, is, is an optional thing in synagogue worship. Uh, it's a very organic thing when it happens to, to pause and say, you know, so for clarity's sake, here's, here's why this is, or this town in the text here is called this today. We call it this. Um, and then kind of giving application w- was something that was generally optional, but the primary aspect was reading the Bible together um, in synagogue worship. Vital. Absolutely vital. And so kind of stemming from that, um, you know, synagogue worship being, you know, even predating Jesus and the apostles coming out of that, um, it does, Christian worship does develop and take on its its own sort of, focus in its own sort of flavor and develop in its own sort of way. One, because the canon of scripture uh, is a little bit different between synagogue worship and the early church worship because New Testament. And so, you know, we talked about this before, but looking, kind of comparing liturgies uh, and go see our liturgy podcast for more here. But even in the second century, uh, Justin Martyr, who's this, you know, apologist, Apostolic father, one of the early, early generations of Christians, um, himself not a Jew, but a Gentile. Um, he gives a description of what uh, 
early church worship in the second century looks like. And one thing to note is there is a massive amount of Bible reading. Like there's a scripture read and then you sing a psalm and then there's another scripture read and then you sing a psalm and then there's another scripture read and then you sing a psalm and there is preaching. It becomes normative um, in Christian worship pretty early to have preaching involved. But there's a lot of Bible read um, for just the simple sake of reading the Bible. And by the time you really get to the fourth century in particular, um, there is somewhat of a homogenized uh, liturgy, by and large, generally speaking. And what do you know? Um, the the standard practice, both, interestingly enough, in the Eastern Church and in the Western Church, the Greek-speaking Church or Syriac-speaking Church um, and the Latin-speaking Church, is you have numerous Bible readings. Um Typically, it was something like an Old Testament reading and then two New Testament readings, one from the Gospels and another from the the epistles. Um, And that becomes the standard norm, plus your sermon text on top of it, right? So you would have from that um, just readings themselves, um, three readings plus your sermon text, which typically they read because it looks a little bit different. So um, there's just tons and tons of Bible being read. And by the time, you know, looking at two um, really great pastors from the early church that had a had a wonderful preaching and teaching ministry, um, Origen and Chrysostom, um, both of which were uh, in the Greek church, um, but uh, they actually uh, preached through the whole Bible uh, at least once, sometimes even numerous times, and the way that they did it was their reading and their preaching um, were, were linked, right? So they, they had expository preaching in the fact that their regular practice was um, what we call Lectio Continua. They would, they would pick a book of the Bible that they were preaching through, they would read a passage, and then they would explain the passage. And then they would read the next passage and explain the next passage. And then the next week, they would pick up where they left off and read the passage and then explain the passage. And so both of them went... Uh, and preached through the whole Bible, read it and explained it numerous times. Um, and so a lot of people who kind of now granted what their expository, especially um, their style was very different. Um, Origen was uh, pretty lavish in his interpretation. So there was, there's lots of allegory um, that, that goes with it. Chrysostom was, was much less allegorical. Um, you know, their schools of thought, thought of interpretation in the, the history of interpretation, which is kind of one of the areas that I'm fascinated with, molding and bringing together, uh, you know, a study of exegesis and church history is my happy place. But anyway, so um, Origen and Chrysostom are, are interpreting and applying the text very, very differently, but their practice of reading a passage and explaining the passage. And oftentimes these were lengthier passages um, go hand in hand and were a vital part of, of their thing. And so if you remained under their care for a number of years, there's a good chance you would have read and explained to you the whole Bible as the church on a pretty regular basis, which is, I hope that's every pastor's dream right of, of what over the course of my ministry i want to teach and preach and read to the congregation the whole bible that would be amazing and there have been people who have done it uh and even numerous times and it's a it's a lofty goal but a i think a beautiful one the, then when you especially in the west when you get to the medieval church things look different our our liturgy develops for a variety of reasons Um, Preaching is much decentralized. At the central part is the Eucharist. Um, There are still some readings. They're exclusively in Latin, so many people have no idea what's being said. Sometimes even the priests um, who didn't, some didn't know Latin, some did. And oftentimes they just read from the homilies. You know, they would read a, you know, a, a sermon or a homily from Ambrose or read from the lectionary. And so it, it becomes significantly less word-based uh, 
and significantly more ceremony based. Um, and can you define homily? Homily. Um, let me get a good one. Uh, a, a good definition. I hope I'm not because it can look differently. Oftentimes what a homily is, is a short, uh, sermonic type exhortation um, which sometimes was done especially common practice in the medieval era was to read somebody else's um, short exhortation from a passage of scripture they would read Augustine or Ambrose or Origen or Chrysostom Um, now there are still homilies in certain more kind of high church um, high church traditions where you're taking uh, a snippet of scripture and there's a brief sort of exhortation, no more than like 20 minutes max. Sometimes, especially in the Catholic church, 10 minutes is really about, <laughs> about as far as you go. Um, so not really a sermonette per se, um, but a short sort of exhortation from a text of scripture or from, you know, one of your catechisms or creeds or something like that. So more, I just want to make sure. I, I this is one of those words that I've heard a thousand times, but I'm like, yeah. I, I don't really know what it means. Yeah. Um, so I'm assuming um, there's, from what you're saying, there's less of a teaching bent and more of an encouragement side of things. It is tends that... to be that way. Okay. I think there's some there's some liberty within certain traditions of of how teachy versus how encouraging it could be. I mean, I think really historically it should be teachy, Um, you you know, um, but a lot of the times, especially during the medieval era, um, they're really just kind of reading lines, um, which ended up, you know, the lines that they read were were more kind of exhortation type um, that were laid out for them. So, okay, yeah, it, it, I think with with that, it could really be either or. But, um, but then again, you know, I don't really come from a tradition with with homilies. So, you know, I, I, you know, full disclosure, I'm I'm very okay uh, b- being told otherwise. But that's that's my general understanding. Okay. Yeah, my cool. general understanding. So, but but then whenever we get to the Reformation. And for all kinds of historical and cultural reasons, um, preaching does become centralized, um, you, you know, in a unique way. That's not to say that preaching dies in the medieval church. That's somewhat of a of a misnomer. There, there are people who are like people who <laughs> uh, may, maybe there are some people who care absolutely nothing about church history. There are other people who are like church history interested. And so sometimes from church history interested folks, there are kind of caricatures and broad brushes and that kind of thing, which is fine. And one of the broad brushes is that, you know, that preaching is completely done away with in the medieval era. That's not true. Um, It's done away with largely, but not completely. Bernard of Clairvaux being one um, who was a phenomenal preacher um, did what was it his sermons that started the you know the second crusade yes um but interestingly enough you know he was he was called the doctor of love and so many of his sermons were were just richly descriptive of of the love of Christ and um uh aside from Augustine if i'm not mistaken aside from Augustine maybe one other the most cited uh, theologian in Calvin's Institutes is actually Bernard of Clairvaux. He's regularly cited throughout. So, great preacher. And then the Dominicans, the, the whole Dominican order, uh, not the country, but um, the, the order within the Catholic Church, were a preaching group. That was their, that was their main mission. So, the, pre- preaching happens a lot. And then, um, even, um, you know, with the, the Waldensians, um, you know, if you're, if you really want to get nerdy, um, were, were all about preaching uh, in the preaching ministry, and they actually did so in the vernacular, which is fascinating. But um, besides the point, so so it's not that preaching wasn't prominent or it didn't have some sort of place or precedent in the medieval church, but it's it's largely decentralized and minimized. When you get to the Reformation, though, um, for cultural and historical reasons, the 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 humanist Renaissance humanist being a little bit different. Um, mantra of ad fontes back to the sources 
uh, the this rich tradition now of wanting to study uh, not just the Bible in its original languages and in its original context, but also classical literature, and it probably goes classical literature and then the Bible, or those go kind of simultaneously. But anyway, it it becomes because of that, I think, and the invention of um, the Gutenberg Press, it becomes much more word-based again. And out of this word-based um, you know, culture that's really developed during the time leading up to and even afterwards, the Reformation, preaching and the word, text-based ministry becomes really kind of normative. Um, and I don't think it's necessarily even reactionary to, to the, the Roman Catholic Church, because again, there is there is some some precedent in the medieval era for for kind of word-based ministry. It looks very different, but I think, you know, and some of the great humanist scholars of the day were, were Roman Catholics, um, Roman Catholic priests, Desiderius Erasmus being kind of the, the main guy, one of the huge um, Latin and Greek scholars. His work in the Greek New Testament is, you know, was invaluable in its day, Roman Catholic priests. So anyway, that's a little somewhat of an aside. But coming out of the Reformation tradition, um, and again, Luther is a word-based textual guy. Um, Zwingli, who we talked about before, is this is one of the things that he and Luther had in common, uh, maybe not in quite the same way, but in like very similar ways. They are word-based textual guys. You don't have to look at Calvin as the via media. Um, he is also a word-based textual guy, I think the best of the three. Um, and so, you know, there's this, there's this, precedent going forward of to be a part of this reformation or a part of, you know, um, even though it's a derogatory term, the Protestants, uh, is to be a word-based ministry or a word-based church. And so by the time you get to the Puritan era and, uh, the English reformation, um, there's, there's all kinds of debates when this, this is, you know, we're a few generations into the reformation at this point, by the time you get to the uh, you know, the Westminster Assembly in the 1640s, um, you have somewhat developing two different categories of what it means to be word-based. And there's cross-pollination and disagreements and different flavors and that sort of thing. But generally speaking, uh, given the Westminster Directory um, for Public Worship, um, is which is, you know, a, the Westminster Assembly... They produce the Westminster Confession of Faith and the larger and shorter catechisms. They also produce a variety of other things, but one of the things that they produce is this directory of public worship. And in this directory of public worship, are there, it's not binding. You know, we don't really take vows to upkeep the the directory of public worship, um, but there it's like a it's somewhat like a uh, a pastoral handbook of you know. If you're if you're subscribing to the, the these Westminster standards, um, Westminster Confession and Catechisms, here is a natural outworking of what that theology looks like, somewhat practically, uh, in the life of the church. And one thing that they do is that uniquely, fairly uniquely, I think, is there's a little bit of a separation or two different categories of what it means to be a word based ministry. They have the reading of the Word of God and the preaching of the Word of God. Now, those are those are are linked together. It is possible to read without preaching, and it is you know there's plenty of Puritan precedent uh, throughout to have uh, what they would call plain readings. There is no real precedent though for plain preaching. Um, in the Reformation tradition, preaching without the text um, is something that's unheard of, even if it's a very small text. Um, but the 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 two go hand in hand. You can read without preaching, but you cannot preach without reading. And so they they give a little bit of a distinction. And so the, in the Westminster Directory of Public Worship, um, there's a whole chapter on the reading of the Word. And uh, and here's their suggestion: uh, we should have a whole chapter from each testament read, a whole chapter. Um, all the canonical books should be read to familiarize the people to the Bible, 
frequent readings should um, should be read from from helpful books. They say like the Psalms. They give that um, as well. Um, but it also seems to to prescribe the reading of scripture to be done by the minister. You can kind of see this in the Westminster Larger Catechism as well. Um, you know, some people will interpret that differently, but um, so there seems to be a need. Uh, not just for for plain reading, but studied, I'm going to call it studied plain reading. The minister of the Word of God should prepare to read the Bible, right? Even if they're not going to make comment, it seems like the tradition and the directory is is giving us and setting an implicit uh, trajectory to say, when a minister gets up to read the Bible, they shouldn't do it cold turkey. They should study how to read it in order to read it effectively, because, you know, to go back to Nehemiah, the pesher, the the making clear, um, you you interpret the Bible and make clear in a plain reading just by your inflection or by your pauses or by your punctuation, um, and so it, it's assumed, I think. Uh, that ministers are going to do this and do it well. And that really sets a different level and different caliber of, you know, here are our our forefathers, especially Zion's forefathers, our Westminster divines, are setting a very high bar to say the reading of the Word of God is massively important. You should have a trained minister read this Bible and only read the Bible after they've prepared to read the Bible. Um, it's a high bar. Yeah, and I think that your point about how we read it, yeah, just even if you're not making comment, how we read it yes. is just as important. So important. Uh, maybe not just as important, but almost as important as how it's taught. Oh, yeah. Because yeah. how you do things um, communicates what you mean. You sure, know? absolutely. And, and so I think that's something that Zion, you know, obviously I'm biased because yeah. I'm a member of Zion Presbyterian yeah. Church, but I think it's something that we do really well yeah. is that obviously we have elders who who read scripture right. usually on a on a Sunday morning, which I think right. I I think falls under minister. I'm sure that there's disagreement mm-hmm. around that. Yeah. But I, I think perfectly fits that yeah. given what we believe about eldership. Yeah. But right. You know, I think our elders, especially Mark Holly, mm-hmm. Jim Davis, mm-hmm. read this last Sunday. You know, every everyone really, but they there's care put into there, yeah. what exactly, how exactly I'm going to say this. Yeah, because it communicates how I say this communicates what it means. Yeah, and that's so crucial because you know there are a lot of there are other traditions where it's very boring right you know and, right. and i don't not to say that the bible is boring i definitely don't believe that yeah but to say that you know how it's read does not communicate the weight yeah you exactly. know of of what's being read it's so true and um yeah i i just think that's it that's a huge thing that how you prepare how you read it mm. communicates just as much yeah. what you're saying. Yeah, absolutely. Like, you know, it's it's one thing to to have at least uh, a professed high doctrine of Scripture. We believe that this is the inerrant, infallible, and inspired Word of God. Okay. Um, let me hear you read the Bible publicly. Because, you know... Maybe maybe you're not a naturally gifted reader. We'll look at a quote here later from a, a 19th century theologian. Um, you know, there are gifted readers. Fair, right? So, some people don't have a naturally um, expressive voice. Also fair. But, but, um, if you get up and read the Bible publicly the same way you would do a roll call um, for a gathering or a political function or something like that. If you read it in the same way, what are you communicating? You're saying, just by your tone, um, roll call and the Word of God are really essentially, practically, on the same playing field. So, so you shouldn't read scripture like Ben Stein and Ferris Bueller's Day Off. <laughs> you should not. <laughs> Don't do it. I mean, you know, maybe if you like 
if you tell people what you're about to do and then read uh, a lengthy genealogy um, from you know the first nine chapters of uh, First Chronicles. Um, Which, to be fair, is essentially a roll call. It is kind of a roll call. You know, if you do it that way and you tell them before and you have a really good Ben Stein imp- impersonation, <laughs> honestly, maybe that's effective. I don't know. Um, but generally speaking, like, <laughs> if you come to to Romans 8 and you read it like that, um, you're missing the point. <laughs> uh right. Yeah, so that that communicates so much, and I think the the Westminster Directory of Public Worship um, really does. It's just called the Directory of Public Worship, but it's in the you know what Westminster Standards is a appendix. So th- there you go. It took to the purists out there. I'm you know I'm, there are probably a, at least a couple pastors, and so not not that anybody sent angry emails but just yet minding minding my p's and q's um okay so so there's that then then preaching they actually um there are differences of opinion in the the, the reformed tradition um as to even if these are two different categories right so um you know some say they go hand in hand and even now like sure there's disagreement um but i you know i think the whatever um Interestingly enough, though, the, the French Huguenots, um, you know, kind of the tradition that Calvin comes from and the generations that follow, uh, many of them, and it was quite prominent, uh, many of them argued that the preaching may corrupt the word of God. So reading is the primary feature, right? They're not saying you shouldn't preach. Preaching is important. Um, but there's, there's, you know, there's reading the Bible, which is you know, in some sense, the purest form of devotion or the centralized feature of their worship, uh, and the preaching kind of follows, uh, you know, and fair enough, but that, just so you know, like, that's part of the historical argument, like, this is where, this is how far the two kind of get carried uh, uh, between the two. Would they put the same emphasis on clarity, or is it just, we're going to read the scripture? What do you mean by clarity? As far as, you know, giving maybe a little bit of context or a little bit of things, or is it just simply let's read the text? The yeah. text is sufficient on its own. Yeah. Um, well, so since they're, they're big time for the word of God in the vernacular, they may set up to say, right, you have to have some sort of setup. You, you can't just flip open your Bible and start reading and people will be like, oh, yeah, I got it. You, you, we're going to read from uh, the gospel according to Mark chapter 4. Here's what's just happened before we're taking up here, and then read. Okay. They might not do kind of the the pesher thing of of stopping you know, mid-sentence or at the end of a section and being like, so it said this, this, and this. This is what it means. They would call that preaching. Gotcha. Yeah. Okay, but they will provide some sort of I think so I think okay. that's pretty standard unless you know if it's in a, a written liturgy and I'm not a you know a, an expert on on French Huguenot tradition um but so with this you know kind of thinking through um it, I, and I like to point this out because this is another kind of weird quirky thing that I have um a fascination with architecture there's a difference kind of looking at the architecture the architecture tells you a lot about churches, um, you know, theology of of worship and what's emphasized and what's not. If you go into certain Roman Catholic cathedrals or just a you know a new Roman Catholic church, what's at the center? It's the altar or this kind of large table for the the sacrifice that they're giving up each week. And again, if you're Roman Catholic and you really do believe that, you know, that you're offering up a you know, continual sacrifice of Jesus and it's really becoming the body and blood. Yeah. It kind of makes sense for that to be at the center. Sure. I think there are, you know, lots of biblical reasons why it's not, et cetera, et cetera, but it makes sense. If you look at reformed churches though, uh, especially historic reformed churches, um, what you'll see is there actually, there are two pulpits. There's one big one. And typically it has like some sort of covering, type thing on it. Um, sometimes it can be plain. Sometimes it can be like very embellished. Um, but, but the big one is for preaching because what center, what center is preaching. And then there are smaller ones for, for everything else. And, 
And part of the smaller one is you would have the readings done from the smaller ones, um, oftentimes, not always. Um, but there's there's the separate. So, so what's you know what's taking the the center of this thing is is preaching typically in the Reformed churches. Now, if you come to Zion Presbyterian Church and a lot of, um, if I'm not mistaken, um, American Presbyterianism, um, we tended more towards. Uh, these are one and the same, and so you'll have just one central um, podium or pulpit where both the reading and the preaching are done because th- they go together even though they can be a, a separate act. You can have a plain reading but not a plain preaching. Um, so that's some. And, and even thinking today to like a lot of modern churches, this isn't to besmirch them or anything like that. I, you know, there could be good reasons why they do this. But today, a lot of the times you'll have like um, a bar stool type thing or some sort of, of cool, cool type stool that maybe you would see at a TED talk and something to set their kind of MacBook on because it you want to kind of convey this TED talk vibe. I, I don't know why I know this, but uh, I saw at some point Andy Stanley... Like, I don't think there are a lot of cool things. Sorry if you're a big Andy Stanley fan or if Andy Stanley is listening. I don't think he would, but if he is, like, there are lots of disagreements there. But one cool thing that I would never do, but I'm like, that's kind of a cool gizmo. He's got this, like, chair stool thing with, like, this little arm that he sets uh, an iPad or MacBook or whatever on, and he preaches from that. And I'm like, that's kind of cool, I guess. I wouldn't. I would never do it. I don't know where he got the gizmo from, but like just the gizmo in and of itself, if, to use a, a technical term, gizmo. Um, I don't know if he had it like custom made or what, but it's uh, it's kind of cool. But but what you have like there's this casualness to it, right? And again, I'm, if you preach from an iPad or read the Bible from an iPad, like that's fine. I have nothing against that at all. Um, I don't. Because I, <laughs> I used to actually. This is a fun, fun story. I used to, um, but then uh, I, it, I had an iPad crash on me mid sermon, and like this is early, early ministry, and so <laughs> you're you're not like super used to preaching anyway, or shooting from the hip, nor should you when you're young, and uh, and it crashed, and so <laughs> it was like the scariest moment of my life because I'm midway through the sermon. And suddenly iPad just kind of like, wah, wah, wah. and um, so I, I just don't anymore. Um, but like there's this, there's this casualness. There's not an elevated, it's a stage more for the music and kind of the TED Talk type vibe that kind of goes with it. So just the architecture is something to bear in mind of, of the differences between all of them. Um, so now then, that we've kind of got this broad uh, overview of particularly the reading of Scripture let's kind of ask how should the Bible be read? And wouldn't you know, uh, our wonderful Westminster larger confession or larger catechism, uh, 156 asked that question. How is the word of God to be read? And here's its answer. This is a good answer. Um, and this is, this can be broadly, um, in your, in your day to day, kind of your own personal private worship. They will, they'll say the Westminster divines family worship too. Um, but also it applies to, uh, I think, particularly um, the public reading of Scripture. So it says this, The Holy Scriptures are to be read with a high and reverent esteem of them, with a firm persuasion that they are the very Word of God, and that, that He only can enable us to understand them, with a desire to know, believe, and obey the will of God revealed in them, with diligence and attention to the matter and the scope of them, with meditation, application, self-denial, and prayer. You know, some of that is particular to private worship. Um, But that, you know, high and reverent esteem, a firm persuasion that they're the word of God. Here's here's this, you know, here's this command. If you're going to read the word of God, and I think we could... Um, put some words in the divine's mouth and say, particularly in public worship, and you don't firmly believe that this is the very word of God, don't get up there and read it. 
let somebody who does because this is the word of God. It's a it's a particular this is what God has given us as his special revelation. So treat it like that. Um it's again, once more looking at the directory of public worship here uh the divines our forebears had a had a massively massively high view of scripture and thankfully this is one thing i really appreciate is not only did they have um a professed high view but a practical application of that high view it's it's wonderfully holistic in its application of their rich theology of the word of god and um that's one reason why I'm Presbyterian. But um, that's also beautiful, I think. If you really believe this is the Word of God, then you should read it differently. Uh, elsewhere. Um, so this is from this is actually from a Baptist. Yikes. No, I'm, I'm kidding. Um, John Brodus was his name. He was um, one of the founders of the Southern Baptist Convention. Interestingly enough, where was he trained as a pastor? Princeton Theological Seminary. He's basically Presbyterian. Um, so he he actually has a classic work on preaching um, called A Treatise on the Preparation and Delivery of Sermons. It's pretty good. I like it. Uh, I read it years and years ago, um, but it's it's really good. At the back, the very end, he has um, somewhat of a, a section on just kind of practical matters of the pastor in their day-to-day, uh, or, well, not day-to-day, in their weekly preparation and delivery as the the minister residing over uh, the assembly. He says this. This is tremendous. To read well is a rare accomplishment. It is much more common to excel in singing or in public speaking. Good preachers are numerous compared with good readers. <laughs> the requisites of a good of good reading are several. And, and he goes through. You know, here are some of the things that he says. You know, what one good preachers? There, are, there are lots of good preachers. There are very, very few good readers. But here's what you need to be a good reader: you need a quickness of apprehension. He says, which is you're able to to capture the essence of a of a sentence quickly. The only way to really do that is to study, though. Um, very few people can do that on the fly, especially to a text that's somewhat foreign to them. Sensibility: your your voice is is able to inflect. And interpret the text just from kind of how how you you speak a flexibility and a power of voice, uh, an ability for expression and emphasis. All of these are are vital for good reading, and you would be you would be easy. It would be easier for you to find a good preacher than it would be to find a good reader. John Broda says, and I think there's something you know. This is somebody too who studied with Charles Hodge, right? if you're listening to this, you probably know who that is. But if you don't know who that is, that's uh, Charles Hodge was, um, you know, one of the great theologians America has produced. He was one of the longest professors at Princeton Seminary back in its heyday when it really was the seminary in America, um, taught um, systematic theology. And, um, you know, so this is a guy who, you know, is thoughtful, is uh is very well informed is very much uh taught and schooled in the reformed tradition um you know stemming all the way back to the to the reformation itself and here here he says this is what you really need uh to to pre to read the bible well and one one final thing you know how should how should the bible be read during during uh worship one thing that i, I want to push on um, again, from the Directory of Public Worship, is that we should read substantial passages. Um, the The Directory of Worship, Public Worship, suggests at least a whole chapter. Um, now, granted, sometimes, like uh, you know, and and it even kind of prescribes of reading the all the canonical books of Scripture. Um, there are certain Presbyterian churches. One of the ones that I came from. Um, that would you could always bank in the morning they're going to preach from a New Testament passage, so they're going to have an Old Testament reading. And they have evening worship there, old school, wonderful church. And in the evening they preach from the Old Testament, have a New Testament reading. And in their Old Testament reading, they just read a chapter at a time systematically through 
the whole Bible, the whole Old Testament, and they'll read a whole chapter at a time. But when you get to like Psalm 119, like what do you do? And this is an interesting thing. Lig Duncan um, told us this before. He was the minister at First Presbyterian Church, Jackson, Mississippi, for a pretty good while. And he decided one one evening, uh, or at one point in his ministry, he was going to preach from uh, the Psalms. And so he's like, I'm going to do a, a Psalm a week. And so he, you know, he would preach one book of the Psalms there, five book of the Psalms make up the 150 Psalms. But um, he'd preach, you know, for a little bit on one, finish the book, you jump to something else. But he got to Psalm 119, right? The longest chapter in the whole Bible. Um, and he gets to it. And he's sitting there, because it was his common practice, and I think it still is at First Press Jackson, to to read your passage first in its totality and then preach it. So he gets to Psalm 119, and he kind of is sitting there with this dilemma of like, oh no, <laughs> what do I do? <laughs> do? Do I do I read the whole thing and then try to preach the whole thing? We'll be there for three hours. Like, what do I do? And his his conscience compelled him. He said, the word of God is more important than what I have to say about the word of God. So here's what I'm going to do. And he told his congregation this whenever he got up there, where it's Psalm 119, we're doing the Psalm a week. Um, how many of you have ever even heard the whole Psalm, Psalm 119, read in one sitting? And like two people had it in a very large church. It's like, well, after today, you'll be able to say it. And uh, that you have. And I forget how long he said it It took him, but he deliberately, in his you know way of reading, he mm-hmm. like, if you want to hear what it, it should sound like to read a text of scripture, go YouTube, like in Duncan preaching anywhere. Um, and just listen to how he reads the text of scripture. It's fantastic. He spends so much time just thinking about how to read it. Well, I'll find one and put it in the show. Oh, notes perfect. So yeah. That'd be it. great. Um, so he read all of Psalm 119, and it took him, I think it, he said it took him like 26 or 28 minutes and to read the whole thing. And he said, um, I I did like 10 minutes after that, 26, 28 minutes to read it. I gave about a 10 minute, here's the, the main point and finish there. And I think, you know, there's something, I don't know, you know, you probably, probably not every week. Um, and, you know, it would be difficult to read Psalm 119 in one sitting and keep it fresh. Um, but I think there's something beautiful about that. And that, so this concept of, of our heritage and our tradition of the reading of the word of God is vitally important for the people of God and reading as the, uh, the standards say a substantial passage is, a that's a significant thing that we should bear in mind. And I just want to reemphasize again, yeah. the importance that it, it is, and I'm going to quote the larger catechism, but like, the firm persuasion. Oh, Siri is talking to me. Sorry. <laughs> uh, the firm persuasion that it is the very word of God. Yeah. Right. Yeah. That all of this, uh, the the reading of scripture, well, reading a substantial passage, and you know, you can have differences of opinion. You know, on do you read all of Psalm one nineteen or not? And, yeah. And still have this conviction. Yeah. 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 But it, all of it comes back and is rooted in that conviction. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I think it personally, like if you're intellectually honest and consistent yeah. and you're spiritually honest and consistent, the only option yeah. is then to spend time with, if, if you really have a firm persuasion that it is the very word of God, yeah. then the only option is to read it at least as well as you can Yeah, for to, sure. to pay attention to what it says, to study it, to read substantial portions of it to right. to think through all of those things. I just wanted to reemphasize that yeah. again just because it's I think it's something that what you said I think about the the fact that the Westminster divines had this very robust theology mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. that worked its way out into a practical yeah. sense right. is incredibly important, so to, important to think about because it's very easy to say we're a Bible believing church. Yeah. And 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 you you can be. You can yeah. you can be a Bible believing church. 
and then you let these things fall through mm-hmm. the cracks because w- what if people don't like it? What if this? Yeah. What if that? Right. When I think the reality of it and the reality of what we all, I think, are experiencing at Zion Presbyterian Church yeah. is that as even though reading two substantial passages of scripture every mm-hmm. single week mm-hmm. is not on paper the most inviting thing. <laughs> no. The reality of experiencing it and coming from mm-hmm. that firm belief mm-hmm. is that actually it gets inside of you and changes your heart, which is I think where we're about to go yeah. at yeah. talking about some of the theology of this, but like it, it gets inside of you. It changes your heart yep. and counterintuitively as mm-hmm. the Lord usually works counterintuitive to like what we believe right reading these two substantial passages that we you know stand and listen to scripture and have these long passages from ezekiel or wherever it it actually is strengthening us in a Mm. way that we wouldn't expect absolutely yeah and so you know kind of kind of from that you know asking because we've we've talked about like having a consistency of your your theology of the word of God, your doctrine of scripture should correspond practically to how you treat and handle the word of God. But with that, we were, we were speaking mainly to your elders that are doing things, but, but we should ask, especially for those who are sitting in the pew and granted beauty of Zion is we have a plurality of elders, which means regularly, most of the time, in fact, when the word of God's being read, me being the pastor, I'm I am getting to sit in a pew and hear the word of God read to me. So this this isn't just particular to pastors but mainly to congregations. Here's or uh, your your parishioners. Here's what we need to ask ourselves. What's happening when the word of God is being read to us? And I think of a variety of things and many of us could kind of go down the list to to say here here's what's occurring as, you know, God is as the word of God is, is being read to us. One, we can say that, that God in his infinite wisdom, because of his covenantal love um, that, that is unfailing, that never ceases, uh, how has he declared best to make himself known redemptively to his people? He's given us an inscripturated word. And so, you know, which is a, you know, a marvelous thing how much better we are not you know ontologically but like ha, ha, what what um, a far more gracious place we're in now having this full complete word of god um given to us in our bibles than abraham was right like he had to sit around and wait for for some sort of message of the lord decades and decades and decades and here we have week after week opened before us, uh, and we can hear uh, through the Lord's ordained man be able to say, hear now the word of the Lord from fill in the blank, and then read to us, and then at the end say something like, this is the word of the Lord. Just pause and think about that for just a second. When, when that's being pronounced, it is true. It's factual. This is the word of the Lord. In that moment, we can say and should say and are saying, when we say thanks be to God, we're saying God has spoken to his people right now. Right? Like, that just happened. Um, you know, and we could go through, you know, various various things of, you know, Psalm 19, Psalm 119, uh, Isaiah 55, uh, you know, Hebrews, Second Timothy three, all of these different passages of uh, all in the doctrine of Scripture, but get down to the nitty gritty. Uh, you know, kind of keeping those things in mind. Um, what's happening uh, through this proclamation and the reading of the Word of God? Piper, who is reflecting on all of those scriptures and also reflecting on Second um, Corinthians four four through six, that it says this. In their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. For what we proclaim is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord, with ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. 
for God who said, let light shine out of darkness has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. So he's, he's reflecting on this. This is Piper in his book, uh, A Peculiar Glory, which is really about the doctrine of Scripture and him kind of thinking over this. He has this line in there. Here's what the Scriptures are doing when, when they're being read to us on the Lord's Day worship. The Scriptures show themselves to be God's Word both by the new life they exhibit and by the new life they create. And so he, you know, he's he's ruminating on this on, on you know Second Corinthians four there, and then he he expounds it in this way. Here's what's happening in light of that previous statement: the Lord of Glory appears in His Word, in all the different ways that the Lord has chosen to reveal Himself to His people regularly, normatively, consistently, is through the minister of the Word of God getting up and reading the Word of God. That's what's happening. Um, Second, he says this, we are made new by the word in the hand of the spirit. The one who inspired the very word of God then illumines our hearts, awakens us from the dead and out of our, our depravity, enlightens and illumines our hearts that now both the author of scripture and the interpreter of scripture who resides in us are showing us the glory of God through the word. If if you're regenerate, that's what's happening. Uh, and then simultaneously, what is the word of God doing? It's convincing and converting. It's comforting and it's building up all at the same time, right? It can do all of those things in the same person at the same time um, and regularly does. So, so here you're beholding uh, in some capacity by faith through the spirit uh, the glory of God in his word. Only like a transforming divine word can really do all of this. And, you know, like just go through kind of your redemptive history. How does the how does God create the world? He speaks. It's his word. How does he redeem uh, the world? He, he redeems it by the word. How does he communicate himself to us covenantally? By his word. And so in that, this, this creative... Um, sustaining, uh, transformative word God has given to us, to his people as the covenant community, um, why would we not read it? <laughs> um, and so that's my, that's my spiel. <laughs> Man, I can't think of a better way to end than that. Well, we will be back next week to talk more, dig more into what we do and why we do it. Um, Absolutely. Keaton, thank you. Thank you. Wisdom.